Hello, everybody. My name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I am the chief executive officer of a company called Optin. May of 2016, I had a massive heart attack. There's only 37% of my heart left. And so I was not able to come to Feastly that year. Uh, then next year, last year, 2017, there was not a Feasley. And this year there is. So it's been over three years since I've talked with you about the projects that I'm working on here in Brazil. I hope to tell you about a lot of those projects today, but there are other talks over the next couple of days that will tell you even more. And I will list those talks at the end. I'm here to talk about Subatai, which is made by the company I work for, Optin. And we have trademarks on this because trademarks are the one type of intellectual property that Richard Stallman agrees with. They are used as a brand to relate to quality and the thing that you are purchasing. The way you say the name of our company is Optin because we want you to opt in to accept to use Supatai, which we will show you is very easy for you to do, as opposed to opt out, which is what you do when people give you spam. My company is five years old. I joined it in July of 2017. The company was already well underway. I was contacted by a person named Alex Karasulu, who has done a lot of work for the Apache Foundation. He has written some of the harder technical things that are done, like the Apache directory server and things like that. We were joined by Sally Kaderi, who is the marketing manager for a lot of the Apache group. And recently we joined by Nicholas Hedman, who became the CTO. This is a group of people who have world-class experience and also believe very strongly in open source. We've developed products amongst us for the top 50 companies in the world. And we believe that we've generated a product that will return the control of the internet to you. Just like open source and free software control, return the control of your software to you. We are a globally distributed company. Most of our engineering work is done in Bishkek, which is a city in the uh, old Soviet Union. But we have also opened up a development office here in Brazil, and in Malaysia, and in Turkey, and several of us live in the United States. What we're offering is open source, peer-to-peer -peer cloud computing, which also embraces the Internet of Things. And I'll explain what that means later on. And we also want to create cryptocurrency mining for everyone, not just the people who can afford millions of dollars of GPUs, which use a lot of electricity. And so they're always building their mining camps next to hydroelectric plants, solar panels, and things like that. Why did we do this? Well, first of all, there are problems with the clouds that most people are used to. Amazon, Google, IBM, Microsoft. And because they seem like they're cheap when you're only using a little bit of their power, and that's true. If you're a very, very small customer and you need to set up a data center, it's a lot easier to buy cloud resources from one of these group, one of these companies. But as you use more and more, you find out it's very expensive. And a lot of large companies who are using cloud resources have determined it's better and more efficient for them to create the cloud inside of their own company. The other reason, or one of the other reasons why this is bad is it's centralized. All of these companies are based in the United States. 
and all of these companies are under U.S. law. These companies also only want to sell things to you. They never buy things from you. Now, if you had a solar panel in your backyard generating electricity, you could sell that electricity back to the grid, and they would pay you money for it. But none of these cloud companies will buy your excess resources to utilize them. And that also promotes vendor lock-in. On one level, they're always talking about how they use certain standards and things like that. But when you really get down to it, there are these minute changes which cause you a lot of pain if you want to move from one vendor to the other. They also do not do the right thing by the Internet of Things. Some people call the Internet of Things edge computing. Some people call the Internet of Things the fog because it's down close to the ground. It's not really up in the clouds. And that means that you typically write an application which talks to your things, but your things are not actually part of the Internet. This is a problem. We'll see why later on. It also doesn't allow you to have true control over your cloud resources. These companies will say, oh, yes, we'll store the data in your country to abide by your laws. But when you ask them how they actually do that, you find out they have no data center in your country. Maybe some of them have data centers around the world, both for redundancy, for legal reasons. But do they have a data center in your country? And can you guarantee that the processing that they're offering in their cloud or the storage that they're using is really where they say it is? You can't, because you have no control. Now, the cloud providers are struggling with privacy. Recently, the European Union passed some very strict privacy laws that said, if you can't obey these laws, then you're going to be hit with very high fines on a day-by-day -day basis. And this is one of the reasons why Facebook moved their, their official corporate offices from Ireland back to the United States, because they were afraid that they could not meet those privacy restrictions, and they did not want their corporate office to be in Ireland which is part of the EU. You have very strict laws when it comes to privacy, particularly with health, you know, hospitals, things like that. They want to keep their patients' information on their systems, or at least in a place where they feel it's secure. There's government privacy regulations, just like the EU. And unfortunately, the country that I call home, the United States, has this really weird feeling about privacy, and it's called the Patriot Act, and therefore, the, and the later on, the Cloud Act, which basically says that you, as Brazilians, have no rights at all. I, as a United States citizen, have rights under the law of privacy and security, but when I talk with you, that eliminates that. I become talking to a potential terrorist. And I'm sure all of you people are terrorists. I can see it in your eyes. And thanks to Edward Snowden, we actually had proof that the NSA, the National Security Agency in the United States, was reading President Dilma's emails. Now, whether or not President Dilma had anything interesting to say is not the point. The point is, they shouldn't have been reading them. <coughs> and hackers are also a legitimate concern when it comes to big cloud, because the bigger the cloud, the more they get when they finally break in. If we could distribute this somehow, their payback would not be as good. But this especially concerns people about the Internet of Things. Because right now, even though we have billions of personal computers and servers and things like that around the world, we're going to have trillions of things 
And if those things are insecure, if those things are, you know, give away into the Internet, that's a problem. And likewise, if viruses on the Internet can get into your things, the things that control your house, like your doorknob, your, your lights, and things like that, that too is a problem. And we have to fight that. And so we created Supatai. Supatai's product line is actually made up of three parts, which I'll go into detail. But the first part is the actual peer-to-peer -peer open source cloud software itself. This is completely open and completely free. You can download it and install it on your system and use it. You don't even have to tell us you did it. That's okay. The second part is a marketplace like Google Store or Apple Store or Google Play where you can list applications and resources or you can buy applications and resources through the store. And we'll go into more of that. The third one, which is also optional, is a piece of hardware called the blockchain router. And that is just like a regular broadband router with one, two major exceptions. Number one, it is an IoT gateway, which I'll explain in a moment. <coughs> Pardon me. And number two, it mines cryptocurrency. And we'll get to that in a moment. So let's take a look at the first software, the open source peer-to-peer -peer cloud software itself. It runs and uses containers, lightweight Linux containers, LXC interface. You can also run applications on it native if you've used the Google, the Google uh, application engine interfaces. <coughs> Through this cloud software, you can share resources between systems. You can buy resources and add them to your cloud. Or if you have excess resources in your environment, you can sell them to other people in a secure, authenticated, encrypted way. And we also hire or harness the Internet of Things to create private cloud environments. Now, why is this? necessary. If you take the information from these things, which may be generating a huge amount of information, and you try and send it all the way back to Redmond, Washington, or to wherever Amazon is located, to have it processed, that's a huge amount of traffic over the internet. And it's going to get huger all the time. An example of this was a bus company who wanted to see if there were seats empty on the bus. And they were doing this with a webcam at the front of the bus that was viewing the, the seats. And through computer image technology, they could determine if the seat was full or empty. That was the application. So that they could then tell the people waiting for the bus, don't take this bus. There was no seats. The next bus has plenty of seats. Use that one. Well, they modeled this, and they tried it out. And they found out that the webcam was sending so much information over the cloud using cellular technology that in the first day, their expenses for the communications were so high, they could afford to buy a little computer, put it on the bus, and have it do that processing, and only send a little bit of data, yes, there were seats, no, there were seats. And they saved enough money in the communications in one day to buy that little computer. So this is an example. Do your processing of the Internet of Things data locally, and then the meta-processing of the information can be done in some other place. What Supertai allows you to do is make a cloud of all of those things. So in that bus, you could have had a simple private cloud of every sensor on the bus, which then was processed by that little computer on the bus as part of the bus cloud. 
and then pass the information that the customer really wants to see, is the receipt or not, to the application. Other types of things that could be told about the bus, what is the temperature on the bus? Is the air conditioning working or not? If you've had a heart attack, you might be concerned about how hot the bus is going to be. The second part is our Super Thai Bazaar. This is optional. If you already know where all the resources that you have or resources you want, you don't need the bazaar. But if you want to sell your resources outside of your environment or buy resources from outside your environment, then you can go to the bazaar and buy or sell them. We are also talking to people like telecoms, host, uh, internet hosting providers, electric companies, because these people have a need for cloud software and they were bypassed by Amazon and Google and Microsoft. Their customer base was taken away from them. With Subutai, they can have it back. They can give you alternatives to buying your cloud resources from these multinational companies. We call those people economy operators. They can literally set up their own little economy and make money from that and give you better service. But the bazaar also allows you to participate in this. Maybe you're a university and you have a lot of resources sitting there running, but you have no way of making any money from them. You could use Supatai to sell your resources to other people and make money for your university while their systems are simply running. Maybe you're a hospital and you have a lot of systems out there where every once in a while a doctor or a nurse comes along and goes boop. But in the meantime, the system is sitting there wasting electricity and doing nothing. With Supatai, you could set up a network inside the hospital to process things like MRIs, CAT scans, or do other types of deep diving type of information retrieval without having to buy them from a big cloud provider and without having to expose your customers to being spied on. These are just some of the examples of how you could be a participant in this economy. Even a university student who's sitting there with an open notebook, if somebody needed a little bit of CPU time for a short period, they could sell their capabilities for that. The third part is a piece of hardware. Now, in Brazil, there is a program called the Internet of Things program. The Brazilian government is putting in 10 billion US dollars worth of investment into this program because they expect they will get 200 billion dollars of payback. They want to educate 1% of the Brazilian population in how to program Internet of Things. I'll do the math for you real easy. That's 2 million people that the government wants to train to do this programming because they think that's going to be the need. So about two years ago, we started a program called Caninos Lucas to create an open source, open hardware, peer-to-peer -peer platform for this. It is done in collaboration with the University of Sao Paulo who has a complete surface mount technology machine. And it's actually made up of three parts. One is a little sensor computer, which we call the Pulga. Kinitas Lucas, of course, is crazy canines. And so we named all of our systems after dogs. We thought about calling this a chihuahua, but then we realized nobody loves chihuahuas. So instead, we called it the flea because it's so small and because every dog has fleas. 
One computer I've been talking about for a long time is called the Labrador. It used to be called the guitar, but we had to rename it because it's slightly different from the guitar. And the Labrador is a friendly dog. This is much like a Raspberry Pi Model 3, except it's much better. Raspberry Pi Model 3 has one gigabyte of RAM. This has two. Raspberry Pi Model 3 does not have USB 3. This does. Raspberry Pi only works up to 40 degrees Celsius. You can't even really run it efficiently in Rio de Janeiro or Manaus or other hot countries. This goes up to 70 degrees. If this room was 70 degrees, we would all be dead. So you'd know that your computer is still working after you were dead. <laughs> this system has 40 GPIO pins, just like the Raspberry Pi, and it's very good with electrostatic discharge. But this system is also flexible because it's made up of two boards. One board is the part that has the CPU, the GPU, and all the active components. The second and simpler board has all of your connectors. So you could design something for the Internet of Things, make your own motherboard, and insert the core board into it. The final thing, which was done by my company, was the blockchain router. And that's what we're going to spend the bulk of this time on. It is a broadband router, so it has Wi-Fi, 802.11, B, G, and N. It has Ethernet connectors. It will have 16 gigabytes of RAM, 8 gigabytes to run the router code in, and 8 gigabytes set aside for cryptocurrency mining and FPGA work. It has an FPGA on it. An FPGA is a lot like an ASIC, except you can reprogram it. It's flexible. And so if your cryptocurrency algorithms change, or if somebody finds a fault in your encryption code, you can reprogram the FPGA to solve the problem. It has disk drive controllers on it to do RAID 0 through 10. And so you can use this as a NAS server to cut down on your internet traffic. And finally, it has a TPM chip on it, so you can implement a trusted computing system to make sure there's no viruses that are going in and out of the network to affect you. The whole board uses only 18 watts of power. A Linksys router, their high end, uses 36 watts of power. And it does not mine cryptocurrency. It does not have RAID on it. It is not an IoT gateway. This system will have a place to put an Arduino shield and 40 GPIO pins. So once you've developed your Internet of Things application using an Arduino or using a, a Raspberry Pi, you can then transfer the shield or the Pi components to this board, and this board will run your Internet of Things application. We also, I talked about an economy operator and setting up your own economy. An economy requires some form of exchange. We are a worldwide system. You use us any place across the world. And because of that, we needed a way that people could exchange resources easily. We have two tokens to do that, one of which is called goodwill. Goodwill is a very lightweight token, which you can use to buy computer resources or sell computer resources. You can use it to buy applications that are listed in our store, the bazaar. And it has a monetary policy which is based on certain actions which you do, buying and selling, or doing things like simply installing Subatai, you get some goodwill. If you write a blueprint which is used to allow an application to find resources, you get goodwill. 
If you help us with finding bugs, you get goodwill. Documentation, you get goodwill. And you can then use this goodwill to buy other resources from people. We have a program to help open source projects who need resources where you can contribute your goodwill to this. And then the, that the uh, resources are then given to the various groups. And this is why we call it goodwill. Because so many times people come up to me and say, Mad Dog, how can I help an open source project? I'm not a programmer. I'm not a systems administrator. How can I help? You can help by contributing goodwill to these groups. But goodwill is not recognized outside of the SuperTie platform. And therefore, we're creating a true cryptocurrency based on the Ethereum blockchain called Khan. And Khan has a very, very important reason for SuperTie. Because if you're going to buy resources from somebody, you want that person to guarantee you that maybe they're going to be up 99.99% of the time. Maybe they're going to have a certain amount of security in their system. Maybe they have their system audited. These are things that give their services a higher value than other people's. And they may charge more for them. This type of information is put into what we call a service level agreement. And every time you buy resources from a cloud vendor, they too have a service level agreement that says what they're going to promise you. But what happens when they don't meet that? You typically cannot get back your money, or it's very expensive to do that. But Subatai keeps track of the resources you use, and we can determine where they met their service level agreement or not. They, in order to have the service level agreement, they have to put some amount of con into what we call escrow. So that if they don't provide you those services, you get your money back. The opposite side of this is a contract. You want to be able to buy these services, but you don't want to have to spend time every time you're buying a little bit of, of CPU time to negotiate a deal. So you write what is called a smart contract, or you use a smart contract that's already written. And you say, I want to pay this much for this much resources using this SLA. And SuperTie makes that match. And it gets you the best value according to what your contract says and what the vendor says, the person selling the resources. And if they are successful at delivering this, then they can get their con back. So the con is a guarantee that you will get the resources that you paid for. We are also going to use con for lots of other things. And we want to engage in people who are selling things to accept con as a token. And we have a whole project behind that alone. We have hired, and we have on our advisory board, some of the best cryptocurrency analysts in the world to give us advice on this project. Now, who benefits from all of this? I've mentioned some of them already. Telecoms, internet service providers, people like HostGator, HostNet, you know, those type, local web. They could all benefit from this. Research facilities who have special devices that people can't access, they could set those devices up as a thing and then sell access to that. Authenticated, secure access using virtual networks and super time. Small businesses can, can benefit from this. I'll go a little bit into that in a moment. And even individuals can benefit from this. If you're a systems administrator, SuperTie can help you set up a cloud for your company that will be very efficient and easy to manage because of the software that we have, which does the load balancing for you. 
Now, if you listen to the large cloud companies, they'll say that everything is going to the cloud. Unfortunately, if you look at reality, that's not true. Fully 40% of all the computing processing in the world is not owned by Amazon and, and everybody else. It's owned by private companies, private individuals. And we estimate that 90% of all the computing power in the world is not available to people because it's locked into their private resources. So we call Supatai the Airbnb of computing resources. It allows you to take those computing resources that all of you own and expose them to people who need them. Just the way that Airbnb takes apartments and homes that people have and are not living in them and allows them to be exposed to people who need them. I'm staying in an Airbnb here in Puerto Alegre. It's very nice and it's very cheap. I, th I said I would mention small to medium business. These are people, yes, they want to use the cloud, but they don't have the time to keep looking at all the cloud providers and figuring out which one is going to give them the best deal for their money. And so they don't. And typically, month after month, they see their internet bills climbing. They see their, biz they see their cloud bills climbing, but they don't have the time or the expertise to look into it. If they run their applications on top of Subutai, Subutai has artificially intelligent software that's constantly looking to find them the best deal. And if they say, oh, the best deal is actually over here when yesterday it was over there, then when you run your application, that's where it will run. Now, these small to medium business people also don't want to have to hunt a lot for their applications. And that's why we have the Bazaar. The Bazaar is a federated group of systems spread around the world that if one goes down, the others take over. And listed in the Bazaar are these applications that we call blueprints. And basically, the blueprint consists of a set of applications in a container that when you click on that, Supertai finds the resources to run that application for you. You don't have to worry about that. So these blueprints, over time, will have a really rich set of applications. And we're working with various groups around the world. We'd love to work with open source groups to make sure that your open source project can work on top of Supertai. And if you, if you make it work on top of Supertai, it will also work on the major cloud vendors of the world. So there's really no loss to you. It, it gives you the extra ability to run it on other people's resources using the Supertai model. We also think that res res residential customers will be able to use Supertai. We're working right now to make it run on a standalone distribution on a USB stick. So in the future, I will not have to bring my notebook with me to run this. I will have the operating system on my USB stick, and I will have Supertai reach out. As long as I have access to the internet, Supertai will reach out find where I've stored my data, and allow me to do my presentation. We're working on that. We should have that available soon. The blockchain router, we call the Swiss Army Knife because it does so many different things. And we're looking to sell the blockchain router to economy operators. If you're a telco sitting out there, if you're a web hosting service sitting out there, let me paint you this picture. You talk to your customers and you say, I've been providing Wi-Fi units for you for years and charging you a little bit of money every month for that. If you use this one, not only will you mine enough cryptocurrency to eventually pay off that purchase, but after that, 
you'll be able to pay a portion of your internet costs with the cryptocurrency that you're mining here. And so in effect, you'll be able to have what we've always dreamt about, free internet. The benefits to end users of taking your cloud wherever you want to go on a USB stick, of having a cryptocurrency mining and wallet in your router, and to have advanced security options in the router to protect you from viruses and spam coming in are all very interesting. And people say to me, Mad Dog, this is great. When's this going to happen? This is field test code. You're talking three years, four years, five years. Today, you can go back out there. You can open up your notebook. You can install SuperTie on it today. It's been in use for three years, and we've been working to make it even easier to install. The base code is very stable and very secure. It's used by governments and other organizations, and now we're bringing it to the masses. This is the first edition of the blockchain router. This was done as a proof of concept. We have the second edition designed. The circuitry is up on GitHub. It's under an Apache or MIT license. And it is being produced at the University of Sao Paulo. We're going to have engineering prototypes in the middle of this month, almost any day now. And then we hope to have it in mass production by the end of August. When I say mass production, I'm talking 10,000 units per day. If that isn't enough to meet the demand, we'll go out to any of the 150 small companies inside of Brazil who can also manufacture it. And by the way, it's being made mostly with Brazilian parts by Brazilians in Brazil. We've gone around and we have several memorandums of understanding with various companies about our products. I'll go into that in a moment, show you who our partners are. And we have our multinational team in place. These are our current partners. Caninas Lucas from the University of Sao Paulo with a nonprofit called LSI Tech. We're not going to make any money off of the sale of these systems. We're going to be producing these on a cost basis. We're doing this to stimulate design and manufacture of electronics inside of Brazil. I've been talking about this project for three years. This July, this month, it starts. We have a roadmap of other newer systems that we're going to be bringing out over the next couple of years. And we'll have a talk about that tomorrow. We're working with the Vambex Group, which helps us with marketing and, and, and better creating our Supertai and Khan tokens. They're worldwide famous. They're very good at it. We're working with CellTab and PTI, the research arm of Itaipu, because they want to have Internet of Things to help to reduce the amount of electricity used in Brazil. That seems strange a hydroelectric plant wanting to reduce the amount of electricity? That's because when it increases, it means that you have to start up coal and oil-fired plants, which are more expensive to handle the load. If you can smooth it out and reduce it, then it can all be supplied efficiently by Itaipu. And God help us, we don't want to build another Itaipu. The first one almost broke Brazil. So they're working with us. They signed a memorandum of understanding to do research in this. And I am the advisor on that project. We're talking with a global telecommunications company. We've handed them an MOU. They are still looking at it and evaluating it. I'm actually talking with several of these companies inside of Brazil. We're talking with an organization that handles social security and welfare because if they send a router like this out to their welfare people, they'll be able to mine a certain amount of cryptocurrency per month, 
which reduces their reliability, their reliance on welfare, and lowers your taxes. I am the board chairman of the Linux Professional Institute, and we develop certification for Linux professionals around the world. We have 150,000 certified professionals in 180 different countries. We are developing a certification for Internet of Things and Embedded Systems, and we're working with the University of Sao Paulo that has an online class that teaches Internet of Things programming and embedded systems programming. 50,000 people have already taken that course. It started off in Portuguese, is in the process of being translated into English and Spanish. The course is free. And we want it so that when you finish that course, you can then take the test from LPI and actually be certified for that. We are investigating, oh, we are also talking with the largest computer manufacturer in Brazil to see if they would also like to manufacture this board as a second source. We have an all open source team. We believe in open source. I actually have been using open source by a different name since 1969. It's actually closed source proprietary software that is unusual to me. And we're, op we're leveraging both open source software and hardware in this program. We want to develop some open source development centers in the northeast of Brazil. We're working with the university on that. We believe in taking raw talent even people who work for proprietary software, to teach them how to do open source in what we call the Apache way. Now, as I said, there are some other talks that are going to be given. Tomorrow, there's going to be a talk on open education at 12 o'clock. I'll go more into the LPI connection with this. And also, at 1400, Professor Zufo, the co-founder of Caninus Lucas, will be here to tell you about all the little parts of Caninus Lucas and how they fit together. And finally, on July the 14th, I'll have a happy talk, a really happy talk, as if this one hasn't been happy, but a really happy talk about a half century of Unix and Linux and the Internet and why it's important. And I hope that all of you come to that talk to listen to it, because I want to let you think about open source in a new way. And this is not just a talk about the past, but a talk about the future, a talk about Brazil, a talk about how open source can help your careers and how it's going to happen. So in summary, we feel the SuperTie product line is unique. There isn't any other cloud vendor that we know of that can do what we can do, and today. We believe it provides value to you because you can not only save money, but you can actually make money by selling the resources you have. It's mature, it's ready to deploy, and this router will be ready by Q3, calendar year 18, to sell in large volume, and actually we think it's gonna be a lot sooner than that maybe end of August. So stay tuned. We have, we're available on lots of social me media, Telegram, our websites. We have Facebook pages, things like that. Join the community. Come to the pages. Come to the Telegram site and see what Supertie is about. With that, I say conquer the, crowd, the cloud. Take back the Internet to be the distributed thing that we control and not large companies. And thank you very much. I think I have one or two minutes more. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? 
If not, I'll, I have a stand out there. It's the opt-in stand, stand number one and two. I'm right next door to the Linux Professional Institute. Rafael Da Silva from the Linux Professional Institute is there. And if anybody is interested more about Khan and how they could invest in that, you can see me out there. Thank you very much. Oh, and of course, you can take lots of pictures. <laughs>